Okay, so uh, thanks for your introduction, Joaquin. And it's feel nice to uh, getting back to your Vanna Champagne. I miss this place, have a lot of good memory. Uh, so right now what I'm doing is the uh, computational and theoretical astrophysics. So this is my uh, PhD project. Uh, it's the uh, radiation, radiative relativistic MHD simulation of neutron star creation column. So uh, I'll spend most of the time this time to uh, give you the background introduction. So, um, and if you have any question about these, just, just pay me, right? Just, just, just let me know. Do not ask the question till the end. So um, I work with, uh, like Yang Fei said, uh, Omar Blaise uh, at UCSB. And we also have the collaborator, uh, Yang Fei Jian, uh, who is right now a CCA. He, uh, he used to be a postdoc uh, at KITP at UCSB. Okay. So um, let me start with some backgrounds first. So what the, in, the object that we're interested in is X-ray pulsar, and also you'll access, but I'll, I'll talk about that later. So for the X-ray pulsar, um, it's a binary system. Right? So binary system, as you know, you have a donor star, and you have a compact object nearby. It can be either black hole or a neutron star, right? Anyway, for all these kind of compact objects, you have a very deep gravitational field. Therefore, you can you know, pull the gas out of the, um, uh, out of the donor star, and the gas free falling onto these uh, compact objects and releasing their mechanical energy, and by falling into the uh, deep gravitational field, and this part of the energy regime corresponding to the X-ray. That's how you can see them in the X-ray band. Okay, so um, today, what I'm going to talk about is X-ray pulsar. So um, for this type of uh, type of the object, you have the crater neutron star. And the reason why neutron star is so special compared with the black hole is because of the magnetic field. You have the uh, very strong magnetic field existing on the surface of neutron star. Therefore, it will change the geometry of the equation. So here I give you an idea. So you have, say, a dipole field, uh, dipole magnetic field um, from the neutron star. And therefore, you are going to start rip the material um, from the inner accretion disk, and this material is going to be constrained magnetically and falling along, this, um, along the magnetic field all the way onto the surface of neutron star. And therefore, uh, the emitting region, the hot region, are always following this magnetic field lines. And then you form this very non-spherical um, accretion geometry. And that's how you have the position, right? Because Typically, you do not. Uh, you have this magnetic axis um, with the angle difference um, w uh, with respect to the um, rotational axis, and this is how that looked like. Let me play this video made by JPL. It's the art video, but it gives you an idea how you can see the pulsation. Simply just because you have this magnetic field constrained material emitting the light and you have the angle difference with respect to the rotational axis, and then you see the pulsation, right, keep swiping through the line of sight. And that's how this pulsar work. Is that merely, is that just a cartoon? It's just a cartoon. No physics. Yeah, yeah, no physics. A part of physics, at least the geometry is, um, yeah, it's correct. Okay, so, uh, so for the X-ray pulsar, there are two major type of the objects uh, based on the uh, donor star size. So if you have the very large donor star, then you call this high mass X-ray binary pulsar. If you have the l relatively low mass X-ray binary uh, pulsar, which means uh, the donor star um, is older and also smaller star scale. And both of them can accrete in a material through the uh, Rochelot overflow. And Rochelot low, uh, so if you have the material within the Rochelot, it means you're gravitationally bound by the um, donor star. If, uh, here is a like inner Lagrangian point. Therefore, here uh, the material can flow through this point all the way to the accretion uh, to the uh, a crater. Um, so this is basically where you start to draw a line between. Uh, it's either um, gravitational field dominated by the uh, uh, neutron star or black hole or the star, uh, and the other way it can accrete is the wind accretion. Because for the massive star, you have tons of the solar wind, right? Solar wind, sorry. You have the tons of the solar wind. And therefore, this wind can be so strong 
and it just directly blow all the way to your uh, binary companion. And then um, it can be captured by the uh, uh, magnetic field and all the way falling onto the uh, neutron star forming equation column, which I'm going to talk about that later. So this is the other way. And the uh, typical statistics of this object is that you have most of these sources high mass X-ray binary uh, and less low mass X-ray binary observed. And the typical magnetic field for the high mass X-ray binary pulsar um, is you have much stronger magnetic field, 10 to the 12. Therefore, we believe they are younger system. And uh, for the uh, low mass X-ray binary pulsar, you have relatively weaker magnetic field. And the period is also longer for the high mass X-ray binary pulsar compared with the low mass X-ray binary pulsar. And these are famous um, because they are um, pulsating very fast. It's the uh, millisecond X-ray binary pulsar. And the simple reason why the high mass X-ray binary is, uh, have the longer period probably just simply because it's younger system. Therefore, you do not have enough momentum transfer compared to the uh, low mass X-ray binary where you transfer enough momentum to speed up the rotation of the uh, neutron star, therefore end up uh, into a um, shorter period regime. Okay. And, and are, is the population, is it bimodal? Or is it just... No, it's, you have most of them high mass X-ray binary. They're brighter. Anyway. But I mean, if you plotted like mm -hmm. period or if you plotted the mass of the donor star, of the other star, mm -hmm. is it... Flat Gaussian, or is it actually bimodal? Like you just I think I actually do not know. Oh. Yeah, I, I haven't seen that. Anybody know? Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, the other type of objects that we are interested in is called the ultraluminous X-ray sources, and the classification for these sources is very straightforward. It's based on their X-ray luminosity. So uh, this. Threshold luminosity corresponding to the Eddington luminosity um, with tensor mass. So it's tensor mass black hole. Therefore, for this kind of object, you expect them to be either intermediate mass black hole, right? Because it's reasonable to have like a thousand mass, uh, a thousand solar mass black hole emitting, say, uh, one percent of the radiation out. Um, that, therefore, then you can have the high, high X-ray luminosity. Or it can be the beamed radiation coming from the stellar mass black hole. Um, and these are just the image um, of uh, two famous uh, UL axis. And until recently, people find out some of them are actually neutron stars. And neutron stars have about 1.4 solar mass. So this is pretty weird, right? Because how you can uh, eject such a, a large amount of the energy from a, a crater that is only 1.4 solar mass. Therefore, you, sh you, should ha you should have a very strong beaming effect. Or some other mechanisms, say uh, magnetic opacity, uh, which we will talk about that later. So all of these sources right now are listed here. Um, so uh, they have the uh, post pulsation profile roughly a second period. Uh, therefore, most of them are high mass X-ray binary. You have the very large donor star. And this profile is sort of sinusoidal. So um, it's different compared to the typical X-ray pulsar because uh, those are highly non-sinusoidal. So therefore, there must be something else happen. And most, uh, mostly, it can be uh, the reprocessing of the light um, from the inner emitting region and the outer accretion material. And I'll talk about that later. OK, so uh, their Eddington ratio can range from 1 to 500. So um, it's extremely bright, uh, and the Eddington ratio is very high, indicating there must be some mechanism happen uh, to facilitate this accretion uh, or have the very strong beaming effect. Uh, sure. Are there, for these, there's none in our galaxy? Or is, is this all the ultraluminous X-ray sources? Or is this these all are all the ultraluminous, uh, ultraluminous X-ray sources. And is it because? Presumably, be embedded in the plane and hidden, or I think I think they have been discovered long long times ago. Until recently, you finally find out this pulsation. But like yeah. the, these are just the ones that are that are periodic, right? Right, periodic. Not not all the UL axis. Okay. There are UL axis uh, 
without the position, and they are still the black hole candidate. Yeah, please. Uh, why does it have to be a neutron star if it's got these periodic pulsations? Aren't there other mechanisms that could come Right, so, uh, so you can have the beam, um, you, you can have a beaming effect from the black hole creation. However, that's not very coherent. Okay. Right, but neutron star is a very coherent source that currently no. Therefore, they, are, have, they have the very high probability to be the neutron star. And actually, we think they are a neutron star. Yeah. Yeah. Is that where I black hole neutron star? Well, some people say some of these are IMBHs, but oh, yeah. Yeah, probably most of them are. Yeah. 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 So uh, this is the very early model of the neutron star creation. So uh, this is the mo one d stationary model proposed by Basker and Sinyaev in 1976, specifically. And uh, depending on how high the creation rate is, uh, you have different beam pattern of the radiation. So if you have the accretion rate low enough, then all the material is going to directly free fall onto the surface of a neutron star, and then you form a hot spot. And uh, the whole column is roughly optically thin, therefore the radiation can directly leave through the top. And people call this pencil beam pattern. And if you have the high accretion rate, um, you will form a shock above the neutron star surface. And then below the surface, you have the radiation pressure dominated uh, material and then emitting all the radiation from the sides. And people call this fan beam ratio, so, uh, fan, fan beam pattern. So, um, so the global geometry basically just looks like this. You have the pencil beam directly leaving um, along the magnetic axis, and you have the fan beam roughly perpendicular to that. So depending on the accretion rate, these things can uh, change dramatically. And there are actually evidence um, in the X-ray binary transient so for some of the sources, because you have the accretion, uh, accretion rate keep varying right, in, some so, in some sort of the sources, and you see two uh, distinct spectrum. And people believe for them, we see both the uh, pencil beam when they, are, uh, ha when they have the lower luminosity, and they, ha they saw the fan beam when they have the higher luminosity. And it's also consistent with the uh, classical theory. OK. So, um, I think 20, oh no, 15 years later, um, the, this is the first simulation um, for, uh, of the neutron star creation column done by Klein and Ahrens. And after that, nobody has done that. So I, I do not know the reason. The, the, there's a Japanese group do something similar, but they do not have a creation. They use that to uh, evaluate the regime rather than the actual creation column. So basically, uh, Klein and Ahrens, they find out so these columns are not stationary at all. So it's super dynamical. And uh, this is what their light curve roughly look like and the power spectrum. So they are located at kilohertz. So it's, it's super fast oscillation happening inside, inside, of, the, inside of this accretion column. And in 1992, Klein, uh, Aarons, uh, in his near analysis, he find out that there's some instability called photon bubble instability in slow diffusion regime that can uh, destabilize the accretion column that might destabilize the accretion column. However, because the uh, linear analysis is done in the background state with the hydrostatic equilibrium, which is not the case here. But anyway, uh, you, do, uh, you, so you do have the regime like inside of the, this accretion column uh, near this um, near this uh, slow diffusion photon bubble regime. And therefore, that's what we're going to explore. Because these simulations are super old. And so you can see this crappy contour plot like this. It will not be very indicating. But it's still very impressive, because after 30 years later, we find something similar. Is that's in the video, I assume? What's the light curve from? Oh, so this is coming from the simulation. Oh. Yeah, so their simulation. Uh, and this, this is an x-ray. That would be x-ray? That would be x-ray, right. OK. So, um, OK, so from here is my part of the research. So after all these years, we established the numerical uh, framework that can deal with this problem. So uh, what we do is we do the uh, full radiation transfer. So it's not and sort of the uh, closure scheme. So it's literally solving the radiation transfer equation, the intensity. So it's angular dependent radiation transfer equation, but we frequency integrated it. Uh, and also, um, uh, we use the uh, 
uh, relativistic MHD, so there are magnetic fields inside. Compared with the old simulation, Klein Aarons, they assume the 1D, uh, 1D motion of the gas because the gas should be confined by the magnetic field mostly. And here we use the uh, full um, MHD equations. So uh, uh, I'm too lazy, therefore I didn't generate the new um, animation. I just grabbed this from, the, um, from my old uh, animation. Uh, therefore, I want you guys to only focus on this density panel. So uh, this is the initial condition where you have most of the gas supported um, on the surface of neutron star. So they have no accretion at all. So it's in hydrostatic equilibrium, just like what uh, Aaron's derived the uh, photon bubble instability. So this should uh, fully recover the photon bubble instability uh, that he calculated. Uh, this density variation just show you what the linear growth of this instability look like. And here we go. Z zero is the surface of the neutron star? Zero is the surface of neutron star, yes. And let me do this again. So you see there's a pattern like forming like this. Th that is a typical pattern. Uh, I should stop over there. Let me see how can I do this. Okay, here. So this is a very typical pattern uh, of the uh, uh, photon bubble instability. I'll explain that later. And after this forms, uh, you see the density profile start to be perturbed. Uh, and then the radiation and gas, they, start, uh, they start to uh, spatially decouple with each other because they are, they are originally mixed together. Therefore, you can uh, radiatively support the gas um, against the gravity of the neutron star. But here, this, what this instability do is that it drives this spatial de decoupling between the gas and radiation. Therefore, you form this low density channel. Radiation can directly leave uh, through this low density, uh, low radi uh, density uh, channel. And then the higher density part, because you lose this radiation support, therefore just collapse. And this is their uh, nonlinear outcome, uh, what happened. Excuse me. So, yeah. Probably I missed. What are the boundary condition for the floor? Yeah, the boundary condition is supported. Um, so you have the constant flux, just keep emitting. So this boundary condition is set based on the hydrostatic equilibrium, right? Because in hydrostatic equilibrium, you are going to have this uh, pressure gradient supported the, um, the gas. And the pressure gradient is basically the uh, radiation flux. So the boundary, boundary condition is uh, adaptive based on the local pressure and what, what, uh, how many uh, pressure gradient you need to support the, um, the base. So it's adjusted um, within the simulation. So, so yeah, so, so you can just treat that, that as a constant radiation flux keep emitting from the uh, base of the um, boundary condition. So, so what about left and right? Oh, left and right is periodic. So uh, you can think about it's just like infinitely long. So uh, this is the solution of the dispersion relation of this photon bubble instability. I'll explain that. So M0 means the Mach number of the diffusion velocity. Therefore, if you have M0 small, it's telling you the photon diffuses very slow. M0 large, telling you the photon diffuses uh, diffuse fast. So uh, you can find out that uh, it's a function, the growth rate of this instability is a function of both angle and the wavelength. And kh is the wave number, therefore larger kh corresponding to shorter wavelength. And here in different uh, panel, like, uh, upper, middle, and lower, it just show you the uh, different regime or different um, range of kh. So here in the beginning, you find out uh, the, uh, for, the, for the same uh, diffusion speed, uh, if you have the shorter wavelength, then the, uh, uh, the instability grow faster until you enter into some regime, uh, there's a cutoff. And this cutoff is defined by the uh, radiation viscosity. So there will be a scale that is small enough, the radiation viscosity start to play a role and damp, the, uh, 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 damp this photon bubble instability and then cut that off. And it turns out this scale is very small, but I'll talk about that later. This can cause the uh, numerical issue um, 
in terms of the uh, resolution. And then if you uh, compare them horizontally, uh, you will find out if you have the photon diffuse faster than the maximum growth, uh, the, uh, the angle that maximizes the growth rate will move from more vertical to more tilted. And that's corresponding to what we just see here. Right, so uh, because it's atmosphere, therefore it's exponentially growing. So the photon diffuses faster at the top and diffuses slower, slower at the bottom. And here you can see it's more tilted at the top and more vertical at the bottom. And that's why the photon bubble instability pattern looks like this. Can you, um, yeah. I think I'm getting myself confused. You, mm -hmm. you described it as radiation, but we have the surface. Mm -hmm. Gas is falling onto the surface. No, gas is not falling. So gas is supported by the uh, radiation pressure. And the radiation pressure is coming from where exactly? Oh, so this, is, so this is a numerical experiment right now. So I'm not showing you the... Radiation pressure? So, I'm sorry, so this pressure originally comes from the accretion power. Like th this radiation, I'll talk about that later. But this is more like the numerical experiment, see how well we can resolve the photon bubble instability. Because this is an in important part of the accretion column. So here, even though we are using the gravitational field um, on the surface of neutron star, but we have the emitting surface, okay. right? So, so the surface keep emitting the radiation out okay. just to maintain the balance. So if there, for example, if there's no photon bubble instability, it should standing still like for always because we, th this is how we set that up in uh, hydrostatic equilibrium. However, because of this instability, you start to have them, uh, different modes growing and then totally um, destabilize this atmosphere. That's why we call this non creating atmosphere, right? But, and, and then yeah. on the next slide, or previous slide, what was theta? Theta, theta is basically um, the angle between the, uh, uh, propagate, uh, the wave propagating direction and the magnetic field. So here, if the wave front is vertical, it's propagating in horizontal direction. So uh, theta 90 degrees telling you uh, the pattern should look like vertical. Okay, should look so like 90, vertical. 90 is, what's your zero? 90 is propagating towards the, the horizontal direction. Right, right, right. Here, yeah. Okay, so uh, anyway, then we can uh, measure the uh, growth rate in our simulation and then compare with the linear theory. They are highly consistent. That's what we want to do. We just want to make sure that our code can resolve the photon bubble instability correctly. And then we can start to do something else. But before that, there is a problem about this, which is what I showed you before. You have this uh, wavelength dependence. And that's a problem because it's telling you if your resolution is too low, you are not going to resolve the photon bubble instability. If it's too high, uh, then, uh, I'm sorry, it, it, uh, only the resolution high, uh, is high enough, then you can fully resolve the photon bubble instability. And this is the resolution test we did. And it turns out you need your uh, grid size near 10 centimeter to resolve the whole system. And the uh, neutron star radius is 10 to the 6. Therefore, it's always impossible if you want to resolve the true system. Um, but anyway, what we can do is we try to increase our resolution as high as possible and just do the resolution study and see how that affects our dynamics. Okay, so this is the real business. Uh, here right now is the neutron star surface. Uh, so we mock that up by using the ideal gas, which is actually not correct. Uh, but there's no better way right now. Uh, we're thinking about a different thing to improve that. Uh, but that roughly gives you um, relatively a steady boundary condition. Um, and then we eject the uh, material from the top boundary. Um, and the side boundary here uh, you allow the radiation to freely escape the system. And the gas are mostly constrained by the magnetic field, um, which we do not need to worry about. The way I set up the gas is outflow, uh, not outflow. Actually, this reflective boundary condition uh, at the domain, but you don't need to worry about that. It's simply just because you do not have any gas moving uh, transversely. And uh, here I want you guys to focus on this density panel again, and also here is a light curve. I'm sorry about this um, expression, but this is simply just luminosity. Um, 
And we initialize this using the vascular engineer of one distillationary model. And you'll realize that how far the real solution to the one distillationary uh, station model. Um, here we go. In the beginning, the uh, accretion columns start to relax from our initial condition because you always cool faster at the sides, right? Because the radiation leaving from the side. And then you form this very nice wave pattern. I'll explain them later that also, um, it also appears in our later simulation, in all of our simulation actually. And then after it enters into the steady state, it starts to oscillate. And by the way, this oscillation frequency corresponding to uh, roughly 10 kilohertz. So they are all above kilohertz. And it just keep oscillating to the end of our, end of our simulation. So uh, just leave all the detail aside. Um, what I want to try to uh, explain here is uh, where this oscillation comes from. Because in Klein and Aaron's paper, they think the oscillation comes from the photon bubble instability. Um, however, back to um, that time, they do not have enough computational power to do this experiment. And here, uh, what I'm showing you that, I'm sorry, um, only two, three, four um, uh, uh, is important in this slide. Um, and two, three, four, version two and three and four, they are the same simulation, but with different resolution. So uh, if I take the snapshot of them at the same epoch, they look like this. So, so version three decreased by the resolution by a factor of two, according to the version two, and version four decreased by a factor of four, another factor of two, uh, according to the version three. So you'll find out uh, this finger shape just disappear because this finger shape are caused by this photon bubble wavelength, right? So it's, a, it's one wavelength that you re resolve, it's just one finger. Therefore, it's a good thing that we de-resolve uh, de the uh, simulation because then you can get rid of the photon bubble. So here, we get rid of the photon bubble dynamics and then we still find this oscillation existing and they roughly have the same frequency. So therefore, the thing that driven the oscillation is not the photon bubble instability itself. So it's actually the um, intrinsic property of the accretion column. And why it have this oscillation is simply just because the 2D, ge the, the 2D geometry, the 2D nature of this accretion column. If you look, uh, if you look at this, so when the, uh, uh, when the accretion column is mostly extended, you are going to supply most of the uh, radiation energy and radiation support near the shock. Uh, but you are cooling them from the sides, right? So it's mostly extended, so you have maximum cooling rate, uh, and the photon can freely escape from the sides. And then, you are lacking of the support at the base, uh, at, at the central base part, because the heat will not be, uh, be coming down fast enough to support the column while you are still cooling them unbiasedly. And then it just collapses until some point you collapse to some minimum, and you are not only shrinking the sideways emission area, therefore you are, uh, you are trying to minimize the cooling here, and you are also bringing the shock more close to the, um, uh, to the bottom region. Therefore, you can refill the photon uh, at the bottom region more and then ex expand again. So this is why uh, it have this oscillation. And this whole behavior is nonlinear. Therefore, it's not sinusoidal, even though you see it looks like, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not even look sinusoidal here, if you look at this. And can you say about how you chose the period you see, or the box size? Oh, the, uh, you mean how I choose the, uh, the one period? No, so yeah. like you have one, you're making one box and it's periodic, right? Right, exactly. But it seems like you put boundary conditions on that. Oh, no, I'm sorry. The boundary condition are actually this. I simply just zoom in. So this is the real boundary condition. Okay. So, uh, so I- just zooming in to show the- Right, I, I just zoom in just to show the main body uh, of the equation column. So, uh, so this is the reason, but photon bubble dynamic, yeah, please. Sorry, um, could I ask about light curves themselves? So first of all, why they could be positive and negative? It's a bit confusing. Oh, oh I, I, I subtract the mean value. Ah, okay. So, so it's a variation. Okay, yeah. uh, and, and, and another thought, probably, okay, probably second question is not meaningful anymore. So the integral is zero, uh, right, for, for, for all 
uh, these light curves. So they Roughly. emit uh, the same energy on, I mean, in average on large time scales. Uh, you want so, to ask? Uh, I'm trying to understand, do you have the same average luminosity for all the models with different resolutions? Uh, you mean for this one, right? For, for, for the bottom three. Yeah, for, so for, I changed the yeah. resolution. Yeah, they have the same energy output. OK, so there is uh, not such thing that, like efficiency of radiation is changing or something. Yeah, so we always have the same energy budget. We just. Yeah, you just have, have this fluctuation. And for one of them, the total energy fluctuation is larger. And for the uh, lower resolution one, the fluctuation is smaller. So this fluctuation is caused by the um, oscillation itself. Okay. Yeah. S sorry, I'll ask another yeah. question. So, so, sorry so, about this confusion. No, I no, it's, it's fine. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, in, uh, different kind of question. So we see that if we make resolution larger, yes, we have larger yeah. amplitude. But uh, do you have asymptotic solution? So do you have resolution when it started? When it oh, when it starts to, to turn over. Yeah. No, it's, it's too expensive. We cannot do that. OK, so yeah. I, I'm just trying to understand how long is this um, wavelength spectrum of uh, instabilities. Yes, so mm -hmm. how long should we go to? Oh, how far we should go. Result OK, yeah. so right now, our, um, right now our resolution is 150 centimeter. Um, in, in this one, uh, it's 150. Uh, so if we want to truly resolve that, we should increase that to 10 centimeter. So that's basically 15 cube. Because you still uh, because you increase the resolution, the time step also shrink. So it's uh, it's 15 to the cube. If you want to do that 3D, it's 15 to the fourth. So um, it's not quite far away, but we don't, we just think it's not quite worth to spend most of our computation time on this one, uh, because I'm going to show you the next one. And this one we do that in Cartesian geometry. Therefore, we we do not allow the accretion column to grow too high, right? Because the real equation is more like the dipole geometry. If you, go, if you go too high, you'll break this approximation, because you will have this geometric dilution start to play a role in the dynamics. And here, we just keep it low, so uh, the approximation still holds. But later, we will uh, open that a little bit more. Yeah. So uh, then what we start to do is, because all the previous simulation I showed you, I used the Thomson opacity, which is not strictly correct because the magnetic field is very strong. Therefore, it will change the property of the gas, and it will reduce the, magnetic, uh, it will reduce the opacity and reduce the interaction between the gas and radiation, especially when you have the temperature less than first lambda level, uh, the cyclotron energy. Uh, and if you can see here, if you are below the peak over here, this peak corresponding to the cyclotron energy. Um, and if you're below the peak, increasing the magnetic field, you, uh, the opacity drops like a rock. Right. So you have the opacity drop crazy. But after you go over that, you roughly enter into this Thomson regime. This is not quite correct. Um, it's correct classically. But if you account the QED effect and pair production, uh, it will even rise higher. But most of our regime are near the peak or below the peak. So we do not worry about that. So this very talented undergrad, uh, working with both me and Armour, and he's in charge of running this simulation using uh, my setup over here, just by changing the uh, opacity table. And we have run uh, seven simulations uh, with different uh, accretion rate and magnetic field. I'm just going to show you some general readouts. So uh, epsilon here is uh, the, local, uh, the local accretion rate as, um, in terms of the adding term ratio. Um, so for the first five panel, they have the same accretion rate. And we increase the magnetic field from 10 to the 11 Gauss to 10 to the 12. And you can see the height of the equation column is shrinking. Uh, but we also try to have a sanity check. When we increase the, um, increase the equation rate, we can still build up the uh, higher column for the uh, highest magnetic field. And it's actually look quite different. And the right part, uh, um, and the left part is the uh, gas density. And the right part of, the, um, of each panel is the opacity. So um, you know, the traditional way to understand this is easy, because we think if you increase the magnetic field, then you are reducing the interaction between the photon and gas. Right? Therefore, you are not going to support the gas very good, and then it's going to collapse to a uh, like lower column or whatever. However, this is not the case. 
So if you look at the um, if you look at the opacity, so the opacity gray means it's roughly Thompson, and the red means it's above Thompson, so it's it's uh, approach the peak. You find out the higher magnetic field case um, actually have uh, overall higher um, opacity. Therefore, you are not like changing the radiation support through this uh, opacity, but something else. Anyone have an idea about this? Because we, I, I think we just figured this out only um, three days ago. So, OK, so here's my hypothesis. I still need to uh, confirm that. My hypothesis is that if you look at this thing, if you look at this curve, you are not going to support any kind of column if your opacity is too low. Because you are not going to support the gas, right? Therefore, only if you have the temperature high enough, like entering into this Thompson regime, then you can give enough um, force, radiation force to the gas and support it to be a column. So um, therefore, you, you will have a shock that jump you from the low, uh, low, uh, low temperature to the high temperature. And it always needs to be high, high enough that enter into this Thompson regime. Therefore, what will happen here is that for the lower magnetic field, you just need to jump very, uh, you, you just have a very gentle jump, right? And here's the lock. Therefore, here the peak is actually narrower. You just need to have a very gentle jump to either across the peak or near the peak. Then you can provide the enough support. And therefore, your post shock will not uh, be very hot, but it's hot enough to support the whole column. But if you have the very strong magnetic field, you have to have the huge jump, like from here to here. It's like orders of magnitude jump. Therefore, you can then uh, support the whole column. And if you, um, if you fail, like jump all the way to the Thomson regime, then you will just form a hot spot. Everything just smash onto the surface of a neutron star. You will not forming a, um, a creation column at all. So this is what we find out. So uh, if you have the uh, small jump, therefore you will have the surface brightness of this shock relatively low, right? But in order to match up with the accretion power, you need to uh, try to maximize or increasing this emitting area. So you have the larger area, smaller emission, uh, smaller uh, brightness uh, near the shock. And here, if you're increasing the uh, magnetic field high enough, you need to jump from a very uh, cold temperature to all the way near 10 to the 8 Kelvin. And therefore, uh, you are going to have a very hot like surface area over here. Therefore, you do not need that much space, like a um, so, uh, surface area, to, um, to match up this total accretion power. And therefore, um, it's more or less flat. It's, it's shrink the area, uh, but it matched the same accretion power. So this is my hypothesis, but I still need to prove that. Otherwise, if you have any um, good explanation, you can let me know. Maybe I can add you into the uh, coarser list. Uh, okay, so um, that's by far um, the uh, the uh, re relatively small accretion column, and here uh, we are trying to change the geometry of the or change the configuration of the magnetic field. So before we use the uniform magnetic field, and right now we are using the split monopole magnetic field. And by the way, the reason we always want the magnetic field to more or less align this grid line is because the variable inversion is a very tricky problem here. Um, so um, because you have such strong magnetic pressure, right? if you do the um, computation or calculation of the conservative variables, you will swallow the gas pressure easily. And when you decouple them and try to find out what is the gas temperature is, it will be the random noise. So uh, if you align the uh, majority of the magnetic field along the grid lines, that can reduce um, or can increase the accuracy of this uh, variable inversion algorithm by orders of magnitudes. That's why we always uh, stick our simulation uh, or uh, stick to the, um, stick our uh, uh, magnetic field along these grid lines. And here it's uh, axisymmetric and spherical polar coordinates 
therefore you actually have a column. Like before, I'm showing you the Cartesian uh, column, which is actually a, a slice of the equation wall, right? Infinite wall. And here is actually a column. And it's a mount. OK, and for this one, uh, we didn't initialize with any 1D stationary model because we know that we cannot trust them. But we use the same, uh, we use the same configuration as before. You have the radiation can leave freely from the sides, and you have the neutron star surface. But we only feed the gas from the top in the beginning and let the accretion column grow by itself. And for this one, I want you guys to focus on the gas density and radiation velocity just to uh, look at what they look like. So in the beginning, you start to build up this accretion column. And the shock rise because you release a, a large amount of the radiation energy and is trying to support the column. And immediately, you have this wave propagating from the side to the center. And this wave, are the entropy wave that is associated with the photon bubble instability, I will quantify that later. And then you form this very nice finger structure, like uh, propagating from here to here. And you have the uh, different finger structure. And the, uh, the, the, the inner finger, the, the central finger, is going to be the highest. And that's also kind of easy to understand, because you have most of the radiation support. Because radiation takes the longest time to diffuse from the center to the sides. Right? Therefore, the, the cooling efficiency at the center is the least. So the center wants to grow up. So if you grow up, you have the extra uh, side area to cool the system. And this is how the system just keeping balancing itself um, between the heating and cooling. And this is the mechanism causing the uh, oscillation. Okay. And here, just show you uh, one oscillation um, in density profile, and also in other profile when it's at its maximum. So here, I want to focus on this sound speed uh, and also the uh, radiation diffusion Mach number. So the sound speed uh, is purely radiation driven. So it's the radiation pressure sound speed. Um, and the magnitude is about 0 0.1, um, 0 0.1 speed of light. Um, so it's very fast. It's even faster than the uh, uh, radio velocity, like the gas velocity itself. So it, it can certainly try to, um, try to con like, like it can certainly communicate uh, all the gas particle and try to approach to the equilibrium state, even though it will be re re um, de established, um, de established by the photon bubble instability. But it's just causing this oscillation all the, all the time. And here, the radiation diffusion Mach number is very small. It's indicating that you have the uh, radiation diffusion speed very, very slow. It can be, uh, it's 10 to the minus 1. So the radiation diffusion speed is 10 to the minus 3, roughly. Um, uh, because this M9 is just a ratio between the um, uh, radiation sound speed and uh, uh, the diffusion speed and radiation sound speed. So 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 4, that's the radiation diffusion speed. And this speed regime turns out to be very useful later to understand uh, the pattern of uh, this wave pattern. OK, so before that, uh, I want to talk about this luminosity light curve. So this is a lot more mer uh, like messier compared to what we have in Cartesian. And um, um, this is ex explanation, basically. So this is the radiation that we collect that escape out of the system. And if you plot this power spectrum, uh, it looks like this. So you are peak near the uh, 6 kilohertz. And then we're thinking about, so the only thing that you can visually see on uh, the profile that I show you uh, is the shock front, right? The shock front is just keep oscillating. Then we just measure the oscillation of the shock front. So here, I measure the oscillation shock front, uh, oscillating shock front from the outer region to the inner region. So this red corresponding to the outermost shock, and the blue corresponding to the innermost shock. And then we plot their power spectrum. So uh, you can see the innermost shock is oscillating with larger amplitude and longer period um, <laughs> compared with the outer shock. Uh, and here, if you plot their power spectrum, it's give you this very nice picture. right? Then you understand where this luminosity variation comes from. It just comes from the different component of the shock. And the innermost shock dominate the luminosity, which makes sense because you have the uh, most of the radiation coming from there. 
It's most elongated, it's the highest, so you have most of the sideway radiation coming from the inner part. And then you form this peak and the plateau. This plateau is just different modes combined with each other. So this is also why this is messier compared to um, the Cartesian accretion column, because we can resolve more modes, simply. Okay, so this is a sanity check of the energetics, just telling you um, how the energy is balanced with each other. So you have four main energy term, uh, which is the sideway cooling, uh, the uh, vertical cooling, so it's the radiation leaving from the sides, radiation leaving from the top. And then you have this PDV work uh, and download advection. So download advection is basically uh, the gas trying to move in downwards, right? It's trying to carry part of the radiation energy density um, to the lower region. So you'll find out uh, the main cooling mechanism is still the sideway cooling, which makes sense because that's how we expect the, uh, the accretion column to do. Uh, but for the heating term, both PDV work and download advection play uh, equally important role. So um, I need to uh, remind you that for the Cartesian uh, accretion column, uh, most of the heat comes from the download advection. That's why the oscillation is so dramatic. And here you have the extra PDV work, probably simply just because you have the convergent magnetic field. Therefore, you can compress the gas like more compared to the other. Therefore, we expect if you increase the order of the uh, magnetic field, like to the dipole field or even quadrupole field, it can create more and more PDV work to support the column. So it will, um, will reduce the amount of, uh, or the contribution of the down downward advection. But that still requires the, um, the simulation to prove. And then here you can see the heat, heating and cooling, they are roughly balanced with each other. Um, yeah. Sure. Um, so again, you have this periodicity Mm. And it's pulsating. Mm -hmm. Is it happening um, stochastically, stochastically, or is it all in phase? Uh, you mean what is all in phase? So, so different part of the region that yeah. oscillating. Yeah, like if you go around mm -hmm. the surface, is it all going at the same? Or it's no, going uh, it's it's not random. It, it have a sequence. So you you see the finger. Um, so so the outer part oscillate. Uh, sometimes oscillate first, and then, so you, you will have the uh, oscillation lead by the outer part, but they all have different frequency, so it's very hard to tell. But our understanding is that you only excite the mode uh, that corresponding to the uh, photon bubble uh, frequency. So you, expi uh, you, you excite the mode in the, uh, uh, in the integer times that frequency. That's how we expect this. And this is also consistent with this assumption. This is like as if you, like when you plot luminosity, this mm -hmm. is as if you put a Dyson sphere around the object and you're measuring how much luminosity is coming off, or this is? Oh, so, so this is, I directly measured the luminosity from the column. So I didn't assume the isotropic um, okay, this emission. Is, okay, this is right. just one line Intr of sight. In so intrinsic luminosity. Along one? No, no, uh, uh, everywhere. So, oh, so it's, yeah. it's, it's around the whole column. Okay. So it's intrinsic luminosity. Okay. But, I do uh, measure this apparent luminosity if you assume um, the, uh, it's isotropic, and that actually enter into this ULX regime. That's why I think uh, this simulation is more close to the uh, reality or, or the so to the source that we are interested in. Okay, so uh, yeah, I'm gonna skip this and this. Okay, so I just keep on talking about the photon bubble instability. And so photon bubble instability comes from one of the mode, uh, it's it's the one of the entropy mode, uh, and the imaginary part is a real number. Therefore, it uh, creates this instability. And what we do is that we measure uh, this wave by propagating from the side to the center. So we measure, measure that in the simulation, and we compute what is corresponding entropy wave phase velocity. And they are super consistent. So that's how we confirm this is the uh, photon bubble instability because of uh, because of their real part of the frequency is consistent with each other. And there's no other uh, speed in this regime. Like, that's why I um, showed you that before. Um, the sound speed is 10 to the minus one uh, speed of light. And the um, diffusion speed is 10 to the minus four and 10 to the minor, uh, mi minus five speed of light. So this is, is isolated island 
So uh, we think it's very robust. And I measure that in different epoch. So they all turn out to be very consistent with each other. OK, so this is just for fun. So um, because we have this axis symmetric thing, right? So we really want to know. We see this finger shape like keep propagating, but it's not real finger shape, right? Because it's 3D structure. So if you look at this, and I have to click this. So it's a 3D rendered uh, accretion column through this 2D axis symmetric. And the, the left hand side is more transparent, so you can directly see that. The right hand side, I just cut them through, just cut a piece of cake. And then you can see this sort of finger shape thing. It's more like the fountain, but not moving outwards, but inwards. And you have this um, very porous uh, medium creating from this oscillation in different part of the equation column. OK. And so for the future, what we can do um, to make the real connection to the, um, to the uh, actual observation is uh, there's XP launched, right? And XP find out that a lot of neutron star um, that they observe, their polarization is much, much lower than expected. So it's like 4 to 5 degree uh, percent. But the, uh, this kind of accretion column model expect you have like 80% 80, 80 of the uh, polarization, something like that. So it's far below the expectation. And one of the explanation is that because you have this reflection uh, on the surface, surface of neutron star, that's going to change, uh, screw up this um, polarization uh, a lot. Therefore, what we can do is that because we have better profile of the equation column, so we can simply just do the Monte Carlo simulation. Uh, so my first step is just trying to generate the spectrum and the polarization using the Monte Carlo code developed by my advisors, another student called Shane Davis. And he is right now in Virginia. Um, as a faculty uh, in Virginia. And here, what we will do is we're going to implement the um, different polarization mode um, in, the, um, uh, in his Monte Carlo code. So it's kind of different because uh, you have to, there's a lot of physics that you can include. Like you can include QED effect, pair production, and all, all sorts of these things can be game changer. So we're going to play them one by one. And the other thing uh, we want to do is we want to have this GR ray tracing. So all of these algorithms are there. I just need to modify them with the correct uh, uh, physical equations. And the last part is do the light curve modeling, because we want to see what the light curve really looks like if you're just going around this neutron star. Um, and with the GR ray tracing, it can um, totally change uh, the shape of the light curve. right? And uh, because it's expensive. The light, uh, if you want to do the Monte Carlo simulation on this system, uh, it can be um, very expensive. So we do not want to generate a light curve by doing the um, Monte Carlo simulation at different angles. So we probably just select uh, some certain angle and then reconstruct that using a, a deep learning model called NERF. And this, uh, we have done the initial test. This can probably um, reproduce the uh, light curve 90% uh, above 90% accuracy. Because the light curve, we just want to see what the shape looks like. So uh, it, not need, uh, it does not need to be that accurate uh, in terms of saving the uh, computational resources. OK, the other thing, and this is actually in, my, uh, in all of my academic proposal, uh, so um, is to simulate uh, the region outside. So uh, the equation column I just show you, um, the source that we can directly saw this column are very limited. Most of them are transient that, that I mentioned before. You have this luminosity variation. You see two different uh, spectrum patterns. And for those sources, you might be able to directly see this accretion column. But for the real axis, it's impossible because you have the accretion rate too large. And you actually form a curtain outside. And sometimes the disk can be extremely thick. Therefore, those light will be reprocessed by the outer region. Um, and that's why you see a very sinusoidal and smooth light curve uh, in those pulsating real axes. And here, what, we, uh, what I plan to do is to uh, simulate the region two over here because region one is finished. The reason you cannot simulate region one, two, three is because the characteristic time and also length scale are so different. If you are simulating them together, you'll find out you will never reach the steady state for the region three. And, and yeah, and because uh, the characteristic time in region one is too short. So you have to separate them separately and treat 
uh, different parts as an inner boundary condition. So for example, if I want to simulate region two, I just use my old simulation in region one as an inner boundary condition. Just keep shooting the beamed radiation and see what's the steady state uh, it can reach um, by feeding the constant uh, accretion rate. And for the region three, it's harder because it's evolved the um, interaction between the magnetosphere and the accretion disk. So people have done that uh, in Titori Star and also, uh, uh, I think, Polar for some Polar project, which is accreting white dwarf. Um, but without radiation. Here, radiation is very important because we are super adenosin everywhere. Therefore, you want to uh, include in the radiation in your dynamics. And there are evidence, observational evidence, that see the outflow of the gas coming from all this system in their spectrum. Uh, therefore, uh, region three is going to cost most of the time. And after region three, uh, you can do a region four. So you have to do the simulation from the inside to the outside so you know how to uh, specify your physics correctly. That's it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. The color bar went up to 10. Uh, went up to 10. Yeah. Take a look. Oh, uh, that's simply just because I want that to be uh, yellow. It can never reach uh, above. It can never above zero Good. because it's okay. yeah, 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 just yeah. Just wanted yeah. to make sure yeah. Thank you. I'm a little unfamiliar with the background on this, so apologies for making that out there question. But is like neutron star equation of state something that can affect uh, the patterns of the column flow? Like the magnetic field of pressure obviously affects it, but I was curious, is the equation of state a factor in this at all? Wait, uh, you mean the uh, is the accretion rate affect the the what the, the equation of state? I'm sorry. Equation of state of the neutron star, does it affect the pattern that you're getting? I, I can hear you very clearly. Uh, does the equation of state of a neutron star? Uh, oh, oh, right, right. The, uh, that's a bottom boundary condition that I mentioned before. It's important. So for right now, I think even for a lot of um, peak simulation, like um, those people do ma magnetar uh, atmosphere, and they even use the uh, ideal gas, which I think is definitely wrong because um, OK, so the way I, I, I understand this is you, ha you have the Fermi gas, right? You have degenerate gas on the surface of neutron star. And therefore, you should have the low heat capacity and high heat conductivity. And therefore, if you have any energy trying to penetrate this surface, it will try to reach um, a high temperature in a very short time. And therefore, you should have a, a quite steady uh, bo bottom boundary condition with the um, high temperature and, it's, and it will roughly be a constant. And then you will have certain amount of the um, energy that can directly enter into the neutron star. Right? But none of them have been treated numerically in all of the simulation that I know. So we are trying to uh, approach to that direction. And that will change the game, because I have done this experiment. So I try to take out of the total energy out of this new, uh, neutron star creation column uh, by 5%, 10%. And for the same accretion rate, 5%, you still can have a column. And 10%, it's going to collapse into a hot spot. Because, uh, this system is very sensitive to this energy balance. That, and that's why you have this oscillation, because it's simply just very sensitive. Uh, so uh, the total amount of the energy that enter into and out of the uh, accretion column in one second uh, is, what I know is much, much greater than the uh, energy that contained in the equation column itself. Um, I think it's 10 to the 3 or 10 to the 4. So it's that large um, uh, amount, it, depending on like, how uh, high the equation rate is. Yeah. OK, great. Thanks. Yeah. No problem. Let's thank you, John, again. Thanks.